Hello and welcome. You are watching the Non Corporate Network. My name is Chaz Vandemeyer. Dustin Trout. And this is Fill in the Blank, a show where we bring you the top trending social media and small business stories, um, and uh, we bring them directly to you. We uh, we debate these stories, what, six stories, three minutes apiece? Yep. Um, but yeah, thank you guys for watching. Thank you for being here. You have anything you want to add this morning, Dustin? No, it's a Monday. I think it's uh, time to rise, ground, and repeat. Let's hey. get some uh, good news going. We're get out the, here. Uh, the entrepreneurship uh, blood flowing and yeah you guys there are people that may now be in cubicles now that this is uh it is may 15th is if true. you're in a cubicle you're not allowed to watch this unless you got a side <laughs> hustle uh this is for entrepreneurs for small business owners for people that are out there hustling so we're stoked to bring you some of the the top trending stories um do we want to kick this thing off yeah Let's get after it. Um, so uh, our first story, uh, this is actually originally reported by The Hustle. They did a uh, survey of 1,800 business, uh, business owners and found that less than 40% of people are um, interested in going back to the office. And that number continues to drop down um, when you're talking about restaurants, when you're talking about um, movie theaters, traveling, sending their kids back to school. Uh, I think this is kind of interesting. I mean, less than 40% of people uh, are comfortable doing anything, uh, yet we have this May 15th deadline, May 30th deadline, uh, where businesses are supposed to be getting back. What are your thoughts on uh, how that looks? Yeah, I mean, it's uh, you got everyone's racing to try and open up, but it's mm -hmm. like if no one's confidence is to go out there and buy, is it premature? But, I mean, from what you're saying, it sounds like people are just uncomfortable, and, and I hear that, but, um, you know, it's now more than ever, companies are disinfecting things. I mean, there are circles everywhere that say six feet apart. I mean, people are practicing the social distancing. Um, I think I think people should be more confident to go out. I mean, if you have underlying conditions or health conditions, I mean, be a little bit more thoughtful. Don't be sneezing on everything. Don't be licking right. doorknobs <laughs> and uh, everywhere you're going, but I, I think I think the confidence should be coming back to get yeah. the economy rolling. Um, I mean, what what are your thoughts? Do you think people should be? You know, it, it's interesting because uh, the offices are the the place that people are, seem to be most comfortable to going back to, and it makes sense because you know you have your own space. Usually, you're about six feet away from anybody else. You got the walls up, um, and so uh, nobody's touching all your stuff. So it, it seems like a place where maybe you can control uh, the spread of a virus like this uh, a little bit better. Um, but it's interesting because the places that are most concerned about opening up are the restaurants, are the traveling, and, and the places where people are less confident to go. I mean, and it's kind of like a paradigm because a lot of businesses are coming out and saying, hey, we're not even going back to the office. This is all remote. Like Google came out and said, hey, all of our employees can work the rest of the year remotely. So I think it's kind of interesting to see that businesses are trying to open up, and yet offices are the ones that are not rushing people back. And I mean, it's always – that first one is the hardest one to get. So it's like, once we're open, I think people will start, all right, we're getting back to, I mean, I don't like using the new norm, but I think uh, things are finally opening back up and it's just, it's another hurdle to get to things going again. And so yeah. I think just the reopening, even though people might not be coming back, I think it's a big milestone in getting getting all this behind us. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I think in terms of the confidence, I think people should, uh, like I said, I mean, don't go all out um, shopping all day, every day, but I mean, maybe do yeah. a little bit more um, we just need to set the rules. There needs to be some kind of public awareness initiative that kind of transforms this less than 40% of people being confident to like less than 10% of people being confident. Because right now, I think that we're just not educated about where we're at. People are going to assume the worst and hope for the best. And right now, um, it seems like people are assuming the worst. So uh, yeah, government, let's uh, get, a, get a campaign rolling. Let's, let's educate some people. Um, okay, moving on to our next story. I thought this was very interesting. Um, a lot of uh, public schools, uh, this initially came from Texas, but a lot of public schools in lower income neighborhoods are sending out school buses with long distance routers to allow for kids to have uh, Wi-Fi access. Um, essentially what's happening is they'll park the bus from eight in the morning until two in the afternoon and people can drive up 
And with, if they're within 200 feet of the bus, then they can use the Wi-Fi. Um, I think this is awesome. Thank you, public schools, for taking the initiative to do this. Um, did you know that 27% of the United States doesn't have Wi-Fi access? No, that's, that's a, it's a big number. Yeah, it is. It is. So um, what are your thoughts on how this can be leveraged for businesses um, or what opportunities lie um, underneath these kind of uh, solutions? Yeah, I mean, if there are that many people that don't have the Internet, I mean – Shame on businesses for not getting this rolled out sooner. I mean, that yeah. the, the schools have to do. I mean, like we are talking earlier, maybe Walmart rolls something out and the internet is provided by Walmart. I mean, there's so much that you can do from a brand play there. Oh, yeah. Um, and getting people connected, you can help them get um, better employment, more yeah. education. There's just so much more that you can do. And if you're the one that brought it, I mean, it's, yeah. a, it's a good hero story. And I think, yeah. uh, I think all this will do is get entrepreneurs thinking like, oh, yeah. hey, how can we do this? Whether it's actual... Um, internet pro- internet provider companies or businesses. Themselves. It's the new ice cream truck that's rolling <laughs> down the street. Internet, I can watch my Netflix show. Uh, no, it's uh, I mean it's interesting though. I think that uh, you know there's a lot of uh, underlying opportunities, and I think one thing is that if uh, if your uh, ideal customer is somebody that is lower income, and maybe you're a product for serving those people specifically, that this could be a huge opportunity for you to brand something where you're just giving. I mean, I can't imagine that it costs too much they've got company cars already yeah. how how hard is it to put a router in the car and drive around but i think it could be a way to uh definitely generate some free press too i mean oh yeah uh, i think that uh you know your earned media uh getting television time getting stories written about you like not that that needs to be the reason you do something but i think that during this time that's a huge solution and you're helping the youth so uh, yeah, I think that there's a lot of opportunities there. I mean, there. like we've mentioned many times, data is gold, and you you better believe that if a uh, if oh come my up, gosh, come like Walmart's gonna do it, they're gonna be tracking everything oh that my people are going gosh. to. So I mean, they're gonna get so many more insights on who their demographic is. But um, those those I mean, email addresses, man, I'm thinking about like you go to a coffee <laughs> shop, you go to you go to Starbucks, you got to put your name in, you got to put your email in to get the Wi-Fi. It's like now you're literally instead of paying to have people hit a landing page and then hopefully put their email address in, mm-hmm. it's like they you're already giving to them it's it's simple reciprocation you're giving internet to them they feel obligated to give you back a little bit of their information so i think that can be a phenomenal way to uh build up a, a lead list and, oh, and yeah. use that for distribution i mean you know and that, then they're gonna have some low like really cheap router that they start selling <laughs> and they know everybody that went to the walmart parking lot i mean it's exactly. a, it, it's a great uh, great concept so there's definitely gonna be a lot more play there yeah um on to the next one so with all this working from home i mean i've always i'm a huge proponent of just the mental side of of everything uh the mental side is quite a bit but 70 percent of uh, people that are working from home are experiencing extreme uh sleepless nights essentially and so i mean that that plays a huge factor on the mental side i i think i mean this is a huge change for a lot of people i know my wife has struggled with it um but is it i, I think that companies should be helping their employees i mean one if you're not sleeping you're not gonna be as productive so your yeah. revenues are gonna go down the drain uh, that's the selfish side of it but two it's like you're there to help if people are are working for you and there's there's a ton of and this. you're not incurring the office costs either now it's like <laughs> yeah. how much money are you paying in rent per capita and how can you maybe reposition that money that was being spent on rent but I mean, you know, I thought this story was really re- surprising to me. I mean, just looking at a couple of statistics that I have written down here, um, 21% of people that are working from home have their home office set up in their room. So, you know, thinking about that, it's like, okay, you've got people that aren't leaving the single room in their house from the time they're sleeping to getting up. Um, they may go to the kitchen to get some breakfast, but you know, that, that obviously isn't healthy to be staying cooped up in one room, like in solitary confinement all day. I think that the, the other thing here too, is that um, 80% of people don't have a workspace. I mean, mm-hmm. we were talking about this before. Like if you're sitting in an empty room with a, with a chair and that's it compared to if you have a desk set up and you have everything that you need in terms of office supplies provided for you, like you're going to be much more productive in the latter scenario. And so I think that, you know, there is an opportunity. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, the other thing that I thought was crazy is that (laughs) 10% of people are working out of their bathroom (laughs) 
Um, and I, I couldn't even fa- wrap my head around this. Apparently it has to do with Wi-Fi connection. And if there's multiple people in a studio apartment working from home, like I thought it was efficiency. I mean, why have to go up, <laughs> go to the bathroom. If you're just working from the bathroom, there's no time wasted. <laughs> you know, but I, I mean, I think that it, it is crazy. I mean, my thought process is that, yeah, maybe there's some kind of stipend, but how expensive is it really to, to, help people to get I mean, a it's even just laying out a blueprint like just guides hey maybe try and find another room or set up a little space i mean there could be a huge opportunity in consultants coming out and uh, that are are work from home yeah. consultants that help the feng shui of your house yeah. and, and help you figure out a good working environment because to your point it's it's I, I only go to my room whenever i'm going to sleep and i can go to sleep like that and yeah. I think it's a big part of it it's like the room should be just for sleeping, and then if you're working, it should be elsewhere. Otherwise, they get all. Well, maybe confused. they could like. Pr- I mean, the other thing I think about is if we're doing Zoom meetings and we're on the conference call, maybe they could do something where it's like, okay, everybody has to show us like their work and space, like so you can prove that you have it. Like, I don't think that that's too intrusive. Like, yeah. if you're working from home and you're being paid, then I feel like you know it should be mandatory that you have some kind of setup, um, and you're not just like laying down in bed trying to send emails. <laughs> I would fall asleep doing that. Yep. Not going to be productive. Yep. So, uh, so work on that work yeah. from home space. Be yep. more productive. Um, on to our next one. So there's a lot of scrutiny going on with the PPP stuff. I mean, big companies get it, but there's uh, there's a lot that the attorney general is actually looking into um, where there's been a lot of minority-run businesses, um, women-run businesses, all the, the non-normal or uh, just – mismanagement going it's essentially um i mean what are your thoughts on how this is rolling out it seems like there's just bad article after bad article that keeps coming out Um, you know i i think it's crazy i i you know the average loan uh amount was like seventy five thousand. over 1.5 million businesses got this last round but um as you alluded to the the cares act um, that was put into place that uh, was meant to be a mechanism to reduce uh, biases in terms of distribution of these loans among other funds that go out to businesses. Uh, I think uh, it, it's it's a clerical error. It's a thing that they didn't think about that um, these under uh, like low income businesses are not being they're being underrepresented in terms of getting loans um covered and so i i look at this and i think you know there's there's already like census data there should be there should be stuff uh already in place where they're unbiasedly going through like it's it's not a good look to see that oh just randomly all of the <laughs> low income neighborhoods didn't get any of the loans mm-hmm. like that, that's a little bit too ironic for me so i think that uh you know they're realizing now these stories coming out it's not a good look that you know low-income business owners are, are not being represented here because yeah. they probably need it more than anybody. Yeah, and I mean, they're asking for quite a bit of information. I mean, detailed demographic questions that are on there in terms of uh, your ethnicity and stuff like that. And so it's like they have the data. All they got to do is look at the data and see, oh, wow, we're missing out on this portion or we're missing out on this this uh um when we showed the graph last time and it was like the first round was mostly midwest the second round was mostly the east coast or i mean the west coast so i mean i don't know how they're going about distributing these i don't know how much longer they can go just like oh let's let's do another 300 billion stimulus (laughs) let's do another one like so people are going to go without it like we know that now and I think that you alluded to the point that, you know, I don't think people understand enough about it when they submit the loan requests and they're going to learn about what they owe and the interest rates that they're going to get after the fact. And so, um, you know, maybe it's a blessing in disguise for some of these low income places where the, the loan repayment process would crush them just as bad as they're being crushed right now. So, um, you know, it it's it's an interesting time. But, yeah, I mean, government, like, come on, if you're watching this Trump you know, he might be watching it. Uh, <laughs> if you're watching this, Trump, you know, we got to we got to represent every portion of the uh, economy with the stimulus and giving it to, you know, the publicly traded companies first. They got a lot of pushback there. And now the upper echelon of the small businesses, they're getting a lot of pushback mm-hmm. there. It's like maybe we should start from the bottom with the people that are most in need of it. Um, but, you know, uh, there's a lot of factors at play, so I'm I'm not envious to be in that room making those decisions. Yep, uh, yep. No, I agree. Um, and on to the next story. So there's something that's that's on the rise called friendly fraud, and this is essentially because of contactless purchases, where 
people go and running up credit cards and then calling their company and say they didn't they didn't buy it and then they're keeping the inventory and then the chargeback gets uh, charged over to the merchant and then they're the ones that are having to pay for it. So not only are they out inventory, they're having to pay for the inventory. Um, I mean, processing fees with the credit cards, uh-huh. all of it. Yeah. Yeah. And it's tough to stay afloat. So, I mean, my thoughts are, I mean, we, these iPhones have facial recognition. There's so much technology where upload an image or take a picture during the transaction, go to a dedicated landing page, something where you have to give some information in order to protect them. Otherwise we're going to have more businesses that are going to be requesting more, more loans or going out of business. I know you're a huge proponent of people's data and privacy. Right. What are your your thoughts? I mean, you know, what I'll say is I don't want to show, I don't want to show my face. The reason that this stuff's happening though is contactless payments are the ones that are, that are being, uh, uh, that this is happening with the fraud, 270,000 uh, cases of fraud last year. That number has risen and risen year mm-hmm. over year. Um, and I, I don't, I, I think it is a lot to do with the fact that people are like, oh, I can just pay for something and then report it as fraud, <laughs> keep the product. It's all good. Right. And so I think that the contactless part is the hard part to monitor. I don't feel great about giving my facial data to anybody. You know, I don't feel great about Apple having that. Um, but maybe something with like the IP address. Like I know when we took tests in college remotely, there was some kind of um, like browser that you had to go on where it's mm-hmm. tracking your IP address. So they know that it's your computer. So maybe something like that where it's more like pixeled than it is like, hey, I need to take a picture of my ID and send it to this business and hope that their data isn't compromised yeah. or that somebody gets their hands on that. And uh, so well, I think that that's the I risk. hear that you're not a fan of that, but if I'm a retailer and uh, people are doing this, I'm not a fan of yeah. forking over <laughs> money. Uh, fair so, enough, I mean, it's, fair it's, enough. It's, and, and I mean, you see it at the ATMs. They have cameras rolling all the time to ensure that you're the one that's actually taking the money and stuff like right. that. So it's like, it's already part of our society. So why not do, we're doing all these measures to, to protect businesses now. I mean, this is this could be something that as people catch on, it's like, oh, that's easy to do, and just yeah. it could be a huge growth, and it could. Hurt it's the a lot wild of west regulation, though, man, and that's <laughs> my thing. Is like, I'm not going to be super staunch in my views of like we can never use facial recognition, but like I think that there's no rules around it right now to stop a business from doing things that. Um, they shouldn't be doing with that data, monetizing it in ways where we don't know about the monetization that's happening on that front. And so I think that there needs to be rules put in place. And, uh, you know, we we started to work on data privacy a little bit. California hmm. set a trend and then the whole coronavirus thing, I think, uh, you know, uh, took precedence over over this conversation. But I think that, you know, it, it, in theory is a great idea, but we've got to we've got to police it and put some rules into place before we can just say, hey, full steam ahead. Let's yeah. do it. Yeah. Um, uh, well, moving on to our, our last story, um, Bitcoin. This is something that uh, is a trendy word right now. Uh, some of you guys may know a little bit about Bitcoin. Essentially, it's a decentralized network um, for currency exchange and uh it's on the rise, man. I mean, you know, this is, uh, it's been going, uh, it's been going up for the last five, six years now. And I think it's interesting to see like economists and uh, billionaire Paul Tudor even put his money into Bitcoin to hedge the inflation that's happening, kind of going back to this triple P loan and mm-hmm. all the money that's being printed. I think it is a, a good opportunity to um, bet against uh, the U.S. dollar as it increases in uh, inflation rate. Um, what are your thoughts on Bitcoin? Is this something that would be adopted by businesses? Is this something where your dollar is stronger right there uh, than it is uh, keeping it in your checking account? Yeah, I mean, it's an interesting topic. I think that it's where everyone wants to go. I mean, everything's going digital, but I think uh, there's just too much volatility in it right now. I mean, three months ago, it was down to 5000 per Bitcoin. Now it's creeping up to 10000 I saw at one point it was almost up to, what, twelve, thirteen thousand, and then crashed in half. Yep. Um, which left a lot of people. So, I mean, it's tough. I mean, I know there's inflation going on now, but I think there's just so much that, that could go wrong by going 100% digital, whether whether it's Bitcoin or another type of uh, um, currency. Yeah, I mean, you know, I think that there's an opportunity here. I know there's a lot of companies that are actually accepting Bitcoin as payments uh, like you would with like a, a credit card. And so mm-hmm. I think that, that is, if, if that uh, if that continues, that trend continues, I think there, there's going to be a strong case for it. And I, I personally look at this and go, you know, um, 
I'm all about having a trustless system where one governing body isn't making all the decisions on what the value of the money is. It is based off of a community of millions and millions of people. And so I'm for it, but you know, I hear you on the volatility. I think it's going to continue to rise. The, the having is happening today. Essentially what happens, the having is uh, it reduces the reward that miners have um, when they're mining Bitcoins to validate transactions. I know this is kind of wild what's happening, <laughs> but uh, essentially for those of you that are interested in it, um, it, it's, it's definitely trending right now. And uh, if you haven't looked into it or you think your business might be a, a good candidate to accept Bitcoin, um, I know that I've seen it in the medical industry even. Like uh, there's a lot of places that you wouldn't think that are that are kind of looking at that as an option. So, um, you know, definitely a hot topic. Yeah, I mean, what I, I've seen that growing trend of, of businesses taking it. Now, if you were a business that said, hey, it costs one Bitcoin when it's 15 grand now. Yeah. It goes down to five. It's exactly. Like, ah, there's nah, risks nah, there. Yeah. yeah. I and mean, there's always, yeah, there's always going to be risks. I think you bring up a good point where it's decentralized. So there isn't a governing body overlooking it. And so there's going to be a big pushback from all governments because that essentially all, all, all currency is run by the government right now. Yeah. And so, I mean, whenever you lose the currency, that's how people trade and do commerce. You're kind of taking the government out of it. And that's scary for the government. So oh, there's yeah. going to be a big pushback on the government side, but that might be what's causing the volatility, volatility, but well, I mean, there's murmurs of us going back to the gold standard. And I think that that's something that's inevitable as well, just to try to attach a real backing to the dollar. Um, so that, you know, we don't just have money flying off the press with no real value other than us just assuming that a hundred dollars is a hundred dollars. And, um, yeah, so I mean, it's scary what's happening, but I think mm -hmm. it's uh, it's interesting and it's scary, but it's exciting. So um, if you guys haven't looked into cryptocurrency, check it out. I, I think it's it's definitely trending and definitely could be a way to um, make some uh, make some money as an investor. But um, yeah, no, that's uh, that about does it for us. Uh, it flew by today. Yeah, flew by. Man. Hopefully, you guys learned something. Um, you know, this is uh, this is all for small businesses. And how can how can you stay informed? How can you stay ahead of the curve? How can you set yourself up based on the trends that we're seeing? But um, good luck to everybody. If you guys are getting back into the office today, um, opening back up, um, we support you, and Avantage supports you. Um, I want to thank them for uh, for all that they've done to help us and. Uh, we're looking forward to uh, continuing to advocate for them, but uh, the, it's a it's a decentralized network, just like Bitcoin. You know, <laughs> exactly. um, if you're looking for uh, a trade of services with um, other industries, and you need an accountant or you need a advisor for your business, um, they got just about everything there. Over a thousand different business owners in uh, the Phoenix area, so check them out. Um, Avantage.com. Anything you want to add today? No, that's uh, that pretty much wraps it up. It's a good Monday. Yeah, Check out of Vantage. I love Order it. some uh, excess capacity. Definitely, definitely. Well, again, you've been watching the Non Corporate Network. My name's Chaz Vandemotter. Dustin Trout. This is Phil in the Blank. We'll be back on Wednesday with some more stories for you. Submit questions, submit stories if you guys have them. Check us out on social media. And uh, yeah, with that, we're on the way out. Have a good day. See you Wednesday. Get after it. <laughs>